Hello, hello. Welcome back to the Story Darlings podcast. I'm Sandra. And I'm Tara. What do we have going on today, Tara? Oh, we are finally catching up with Sarah J. Mass and finishing part two or like three and four in the book. I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the second half of Crescent City 2, House of Sky and Breath. So we are here. Now we get to talk about all the things. And for all of you people who have read this a while ago, I'm sorry because (laughs) it ends horribly to have to wait. Like, I don't even want to wait two weeks that I'm going to have to wait from finishing this book to the new release. So, right. You have like, I don't know, like patience out the ass something because no it's been like years of just going down rabbit holes and seeing what everyone's theories are and how they kind of measure up against your own theories for what's happening but no one knows what the hell is going on like i'm so sick of watching another theory like tiktok or a video or any like blog post i just want to know what happens already so lucky for us by the time this episode airs House of Flame and Shadow is probably going to be out or hours from being released. So if you are like me or Tara, I think we have ours like pre-ordered on the Kindle. So those Mm -hmm. will be released at midnight. But if you're Central Time US, I think we actually get those at 11 p.m. like Monday night. So we could like get a head start reading, which I plan on doing. So we'll see how this goes. I'm going to be off the map. Kids can't reach me. Husband can't reach me. I'm just going to be locked up reading. (laughs) Yeah. I think I also have it on Audible, so I'm going to do what I did with this. Like, I read the second half of this book in, like, five hours because I had my Audible going at three times the speed and was just following along in my Kindles. So that will probably be what I'm doing. (laughs) Have you seen real-life book reviewers' um, little Instagram reel where her husband was posting, like, oh, how it is being married to, like, a... An audiobook listener. <laughs> I felt seen in that because, like, all the things were me. I'm like, oh, so other people do this. The script. Yes. yes, we order the physical book, and then we're like, can't wait to read it on my Kindle or or my phone. Or it's like talking a different language and playing at triple speed. Mm-hmm. Like, Kyle can't understand what the hell is going on. Justin comes in, and he's like... <laughs> Is that is that English? Like, <laughs> what's going on here? And it's it's great. It's like a, a hiding mechanism because like he, he always randomly comes in on the spicy scenes. Oh, but he can't understand that it's a spicy scene. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm like, great, go, bye. <laughs> yes. Very, very much feeling seen. Like he came in on the second chapter of this part that we're discussing and oh, that's <laughs> did funny. not catch on what was going on. If you're just tuning in, so we split each Sarah J. Mass book just right down the middle. So we covered the first 38 chapters last week and we ended on when Ethan and Bryce go to visit the mystics. And Therian. Therian was there. Because it was all Therian's dumb idea. Yes, Therian has many dumb ideas in the second half of this book. Like, he goes from being one of my favorite comic relief characters to, dude, what the fuck are you doing? Like, I feel like he started at the beginning of this book, too. Like, because we get introduced with this dumb idea that he, like, fell for the, the, like, queen's daughter didn't even fall for her. He just seduced her. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like, well, I mean, when I say fell for her, like he fell for her looks and seduced her and took her virginity. And then he's like, peace, like fuck boy moment out the ass. And then now he's like living with the repercussions of that. Yes. And having to live with the repercussions of that with a queen who is not to be trifled with. She seems, I don't know, I get really bad kind of evil vibes from her she reminds me of Maeve like if Maeve had a daughter how Maeve would be acting with that daughter oh so oh that's yes yep I agree Um, with that observation Mm -hmm. so yeah he he royally fucked himself (laughs) and he has not changed his behavior to like act better since no No, I mean, we'll talk about more examples of this that happened in the second half. But yeah, Therian just like, 
I don't know why I like blocked all of this out from my memory for some reason. <laughs> I was just like, okay, he was just so funny and lovable. And then this second half, I was just like, what are you doing? But anywho, so they go to visit the mystics. And I think last week we ended on, <laughs> she ends up going to the prince of hell named Thanatos. And Thanatos is like, let me see them. Cause he wants to know who's visiting him and, you know, spying around right now. And then this chapter picks up with him kind of taking revenge on them and feasting like on the male mystic. And I think shit just fit, hits the fan and they start unplugging the guy. So it's very much, I think we talked about like matrix last time and some other stuff. And mm -hmm. it's just like undoing all the tubes, even though this guy is like somewhere else, like his soul has like gone somewhere else. And they're just trying to unhook him as fast as possible. And a lot of the machinery breaks and stuff and the astronomy, the astronomer is not happy about that. And um, there's some mention of, like, they might not make it out, basically. Yeah. If you unplug them, that's bad for them. And they do it anyway. And then the machinery breaks. Mm -hmm. And I don't think uh, they leave on good terms. The astronomers basically, like, just, you know, get out. You're not welcome back here type of thing. So then the next chapter, you want to talk about it because you, you talked about your husband walking in triple speed part, but. So Hunt got in trouble for leaving Celestina on her, I guess, like engagement party night, wedding party night. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Reception, like whatever you want to call. Your procreation celebration night. Yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, so he got in trouble because he went to Bryce's house because that's when Sabine was there, like pissed off that like they're going to make a coup for the wolves. Right. So he his punishment was to spend two weeks at the barracks. So he does not get to see Bryce. And so this chapter, we see them taking things into their own hands and having a little phone sex. Literally into their own hands. <laughs> yes, yes. And so, yeah, we get like one of our first spicy, like full, full spicy scenes with Bryce and Hunt. That is all we'll talk about because it was quite spicy. Um, mm -hmm. It was like late at night. I think Bryce had her apartment to herself this night didn't she or something like that or she was being very quiet i can't remember the details but i think she had it to herself because at this point ethan has moved to ruins oh, yeah. right mm -hmm. and then like if hunt's not there she's by herself mm -hmm. um which i think we have had other spicy scenes from them but this yes is, like, they've the done first... like oral for each other yeah like back and forth and then this one they're just you know, separated. So what else are you going to do? So funny. Yeah. They're building up still. Yes. Building up. Their mating bond has snapped into place and they're kind of like, it's kind of like an Akatar when Resand was talking about how the mating bond works and how they get very territorial and like all they can see is their mate and getting with their mate and pretty much they just hook up in a cabin for like several days straight before, you know, greeting the rest of the world. And so they're very much in that kind of mode. Mm -hmm. It's very similar. Well, and that happened to Rowan and Aelin, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, he got very territorial. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then we move on to more training for Bryce, because as different people have hinted, she has not, you know, gone below the tip of the iceberg as far as what she can do with her powers. So she spends more time with Prince Cormac, uh, training specifically in this teleporting ability. You worded it so funny, like, like being kind of like a little battery that she has to be charged up to be able to do. So she's doing so, that and it's exhausting to her. Although it is quite funny how other people react to that as they're coming in on that scene. Like they're like, wait a minute, she's, she, what's going on? Yeah. Um, yeah. I think it was Flynn. Like, I I enjoy the hell out of Flynn. Like, he is comedy, but like a sarcastic comedy. Uh-huh. And he's like flirtatious and like... Didn't they get into like a little tiff in the second half? And he started teasing Bryce about how she used to write her name Lady mm -hmm. Bryce Flynn or whatever. Yeah. And then she's like, basically, I grew... Like, I got better, and you're still stuck. 
yeah. where you were. Did this happen to you? But as I was listening to the audible version of it, I was like, why does Tristan Flynn have a like Southern accent? Did you pick up on that? No, but like Cormac has like a like Scottish Irish accent or something. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Um, I was reading it three times the speed. It'd probably be more obvious which one it is <laughs> if I wasn't. But like, I did not picture that in my head. I know that was a very bold choice to have him with that accent. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense with his name. Like that is like a you know Scottish or Irish sounding name and it kind of makes sense as you start getting more into the world building that Mm -hmm. starts to unfold in this half of the book because you made this um observation in akatar when you were looking at the math the map of prithian and you're like oh it kind of looks like europe with like you know Mm -hmm. ireland over here and um all of that stuff and if the world building proves true when we read Flame and Shadow and Cormac and the Avalon, Avalon Fay are from like this missing court that was on a little misty isle. That kind of makes sense, right? Yeah. Yeah. I guess the accent. So I enjoyed that. It was mm-hmm. like, I don't read my characters in accents. <laughs> Me so either. like when I hear it, I'm like, oh, Wow. Maybe I should be reading them in accents, but I'm not that great at, like, accents in my head. It would sound very weird. I mean, I definitely was not expecting the southern accent from Flynn. I was like, didn't he grow up with these people? None of them have an accent. Like, where did he get his from? But I don't know. I don't know if he did, in fact, grow up with them or if, like... Maybe just college. Kind of in London. Like, you have people that live all over England But if they're aristocrats, they come in contact a lot because of, like, being aristocrats, right? And he is. So I'm wondering if maybe it's something like that where they didn't actually grow up together, but they kind of did at these events that everybody was supposed to attend. Societally speaking. Yeah. Yeah. That would make sense. So they've been friends their whole lives, but weren't next door neighbors kind of thing. Yeah. A lot of people were like kind of mad about the casting for Rizan's character in Akatar because he, he has like a very East Coast kind of accent. And a lot of people pictured him having like a British accent. And I was just like, I didn't picture that at all. I'm like, I thought the actor got it pretty accurate with what I was just doing in my head. So I don't know. It's just weird. I don't think I pictured Reese with the English accent either. <laughs> like, because this is very stereotypical, but like... <laughs> He just doesn't seem like that kind of a posh guy. He seems more like a a New York swagger, like personality, like take no shit. I'm I'm the top. Whereas like that's not the vibe I get from British people. <laughs> You're like just let us know if we're totally off base here, people. <laughs> Although like <laughs> Lucifer has yes, a British I gonna, accent. I was going to bring up Lucifer. Here we go. And I love that. So, like, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just, like, all over the place with my... Like, I, I feel like the British accent really fits Lucifer's personality. If you haven't tuned in before, Tara is adamant that Rhysand's character, like, reminds her of the Lucifer actor from that television series, which I've only seen, like, the first season of, so... He grows from the first season, like... Okay. I I she goes... Been, I've been trying to get Sandra to, like, watch the series, and she won't, but here I've sat and read how many books now? Eight, five, hey, that's I'm in the 13, second 14, I'm in 15, the second 15, 15, 15, like, 800-page books, and she's in the second season. Like, she's made it, like, 12 episodes. What I'm hearing is my bestie <laughs> is keeping score. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I actually, even more books because I also read The Fourth Wing on my break from reading. I got to keep you busy, you know. Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, I I guess I'm all over the place because I think that that fits his swaggering personality right there. He does have the swaggering, but I just found Lucifer to be like a little bit goofy, you know, whereas mm-hmm. Rizan seemed more like tragic and had that swaggering confidence that was a mask. I could see Tristan having a British accent. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like that would fit in my head. And that's what I envisioned of him is like he's like some sort of like British aristocrat. Yeah. 
yeah. kind of thing. And that just could be that that's really the only aristocrats that I know of, um, because we don't really have those here in America. So like maybe that's mm-hmm. why it just like automatically like, oh, he's British. Yeah, but back to Tristan and Declan, pretty much their kind of roles the second half of the book is Declan doing what he does, which is hacking into video and audio systems. And so... They learn that Danica was deep in some shit doing some behind the scenes investigation because Mordak is her father and she is half bloodhound and she's able to smell like heritages and bloodlines and stuff like very sensitive nose to that sort of thing. So they start combing through gallery footage of times that Danica had visited Bryce and it was like anytime Bryce stepped out of the room, Danica would be like very focused on grabbing a book to like go through it and stuff behind the scenes and not telling anyone about it. So they're locating this kind of footage and then they do find that Danica was interested in a book called wolves through time. And it basically was hiding the fact that there was another Fendir. What's the word air? Yeah. Air. Another Fendir air. One of the other things that they figure out through this research is that the wolves are not actually wolves. Mm -hmm. That they were fae that went into their wolf form and just stayed. So I thought that was very interesting and kind of a tie back to like both Throne of Glass and Akatar because like the wolves, the shifting into animals and things like that, because we saw that in throne of glass with like rowan and his cobble do you remember fenris moon mm-hmm. meme mm-hmm, mm-hmm. i loved fenris fenris was amazing and it's interesting how close his name looks to fendir right mm-hmm. like it just wouldn't surprise me that sarah j mass like plans these things out to like visually allude to those kinds yeah. of connections but, and yeah. then you also had it in akatar with the wolf that kind of started it all which, what was his name? It was close, too, wasn't it? Uh, are you talking about the one that Tamlin sent over that uh-huh. Feyre killed? Andrus. Andrus, okay. Uh-huh. So you see that, too. And so you see some connection with the Spring Court. Uh-huh. And then we've got potential connections with the Dusk Court that no longer exists in Akatar, right? Mm-hmm. Um, with Dusk Truth, if we're putting our theories in place. Even like the Pegasuses that came from this prison island in Akatar. Mm-hmm. There's like so many things. Like if Bryce is like, turns out to be an heir or someone important from that line. I really hope that she is the heir to the Pegasuses because, <laughs> yes, it's so like weird to say that word. Anyway, I hope she is because like little, like it's been hinted like the connection with unicorns or not unicorn, Pegasus and unicorns and like all of those with her throughout the book. And I really hope that that is something that Sarah J. Mass was like comically putting in there. You know, like I really do. Even the slumber party in Silver Flames with Emery and Nesta Mm -hmm. and and the little Pegasus. Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh. She's like putting it out there. There was even a post that Sarah J. Mass posted like when she was talking about what the next Crescent City book was going to be called. And she's like working at her computer, typing the title out, you know, House of Flame and Shadow. And she has her like little purple, like, was it purple? Might have been different color. My Little Pony. like Jelly Jubilee. Her little Jelly Jubilee. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like with the Pegasuses, um, being on the covers of all of these, like, I really hope that that comes back in because I love me some Pegasus. Like Hercules in the first scene were a little oh like... Oh my God. It's just so mm, cute. So cute. If I were able to create an animal that automatically becomes real, it would be that. Like it'd be a little horse with wings. Bryce loses her shit when she sees otters. Like wait until she sees a unicorn Pegasus. She will lose yes. her shit. Yes. <laughs> So the Pegasus like word just like brought me back to Gilmore Girls where they were trying to figure out the plural of cul de sacs. And it's like Coles de sac. Col de sac. Uh-huh. Like, but the S is on coal. So it's Coles de sac. Coles de sac. Not mm. cul de sacs. And so like that just doesn't say sound right either. So anyway. I'm with I'm with Lorelai on that. Like that can't be right. But 
I digress. Pegasus doesn't sound right either. And then Bryce visits the Wolf Prime because she is trying to get more information about why Danica might have been interested in wolf lineages because maybe he'll be sentient enough to be able to answer that question or remember something that's important, right? And all he says is that the wolves yielded their true nature, right? And he kind of hints to the fact that they just accepted their place and bowed down to the Asteri. And then they talk about Ethan, like Bryce tells him what (laughs) Sabine did to Ethan by ejecting him from her wolf pack. And he was basically willing to make Ethan an alpha. Ethan is an alpha. Yeah. Um, And so he is basically like, well, Ethan deserves to be an alpha, basically, because that's his blood right. Yes. And Ethan was also the one that realized that one of the mystics, the female that was at the astronomers, was an alpha wolf. And he remembers her scent. The Prime gets a lot of visits this half of the book. Like, little old man's like, I'm tired, people. Leave me alone. But Ethan also visits the Prime and is trying to get him to help him go and save this wolf that's a mystic. And she had mentioned that she had been sold into the mystic whatever at three and um, that she doesn't necessarily want to leave because at least if she's there, she knows her family is getting food. She's basically a slave there. She also said her town was like Nena or something. Mm -hmm. Like how much are you really buying that story? Because, I mean, she was three when she came over. Yeah. The Prime recognizes it right and so when ethan mentions that she's an alpha and she was sold into this at like the age of three he's the prime hints that there is another fendir heir so i'm wondering if that made sense to him like maybe he was traveling at the same time or something happened and one of his either kids or grandkids i think she's like a younger i get the impression that she's younger So grandkids went missing. And so he hints that this is another heir of the Fendir line. But he also hints that she could take Sabine's place, right? And so that hints to me that she may be a little older, like maybe she's his kid. Sabine had quite the reaction, didn't she, Mm -hmm. too, to this news. It was very suspicious. Yeah. And so I don't quite know how old this this lady is. Like, I don't know if, like, being a mystic keeps you younger looking or, like, she's a wolf, so she already is lo- younger looking. So I don't know if she is, in fact, Danica's age or Sabine's age. But it, it was hinted that she would be the one to make it to where Sabine doesn't get control, which I'm all for because Sabine's a bitch. Yeah, we have been so over Sabine <laughs> the series. She... Nothing good about her at all. And then we we see Bryce goes to Celestina and she needs Hunt to go to like the bone quarter, right? Like that's where she's visiting. Mm -hmm. And so she wants him to visit with her. And so she talks to Celestina and she's like, hey, I'm going to go visit my parents. And like Hunt is supposed to go with us. So can he like come and break his two weeks away, like staying in here and just go with me and then he'll come back. And Celestine is like, no, he can just leave. He's like too much of a morale pool right now. He's like, he's not being fun to be around. So like mopey, <laughs> um, but like make him stay the night so that like he doesn't know. And then he can just leave tomorrow or whatever. And they obviously don't go to her parents' house and they go visit the bone quarter and Baxian follows them. Baxian has seemed a little shifty, but like, I told you, I kind of think he's going for the, like, right causes. Like, he's not still in league with the harpy and, like, the hind. And I was happy that that was proven. He's very cute in his eagerness to help and prove, like, which side he's on, right? Yeah. While still being relegated to, like, hanging back at the Comidium. Like, Hunt is so mean to him. He's just like, go away. He's, like, treating him like a puppy. <laughs> He's, like, the little brother that, like, nobody wants around, right? Like, Yeah, I feel bad for him. So Hunt has been very hard on him because he was like, you were, like, right in league with them before I left. And he's like, things change. People change. And we figure out the reason he changed is he is Danica's mate. And so when he met her, he, like, 180, like, to be a better person for her. And... 
I mean, Danica is just keeping secrets left and right. There was like a throwaway line in the first book whenever Bryce and them were teasing Danica about how long it's been since she got laid. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, yeah, it's been like three years. And Danica is like correcting them like, oh, it's been it's only been two years or, or something like that. And it was just that kind of like one single mention in the entire book. But it's like that's what SJM is so good at, just sprinkling in like these little things. It was two years ago that she met Vaxine. And mm -hmm. so she hasn't like, I think the comment that they made is not that she's since she's gotten laid, but since she's like fucked around. Right. Yeah. She always just held her cards so close. Mm -hmm. Bryce, like you see Bryce getting very frustrated with mm -hmm. what her relationship with Danica was because being real and genuine is very important to Bryce. And she just feels like everything she learns is more evidence that proves otherwise that like Bryce was living in like a fantasy land thinking that she was over here on this level whenever behind the scenes Danica was like working on all this shit and not letting her in and I don't know it just kind of tarnishes their friendship in a way I think she's just frustrated but then you see Bryce doing kind of a similar thing with keeping things from people right keeping things and then flaunting other things and pissing like Juniper off and, and, you know, adjacently Fury. But on that, I can see where she came from. Like, she knew that the reason somebody else was getting it is because they had high-powered friends. And she's like, but you have a high-powered friend, too. I'm a princess. Um, and so she <laughs> used her princess title to, like, get Juniper the role. And Juniper's like, no, I need to get the role of principal on my own. But, like... She had, like, the only reason the other person got it was because they used undue influence. So, like, if you, like, negate that, if you're like, hey, both sides have undue influence, like, give it based off of who's the best. Like, I think that that's where Bryce was trying to, like, make a point is, like, both of these principal, like, interviewees or whatever you want to call them have powerful friends so i think juniper's problem was i mean she was treated as like this amazing dancer like top of her class which she is but i think it was after all that shit happened at, with the mm -hmm. gates opening up and the demons because juniper decided to speak up at all these rich mm -hmm. fucks that were just being like Assholes. not wanting anything to do with the regular people the regular citizens and helping them and juniper spoke up and said something and that pissed off a lot of influential people and but juniper's always been the type that she doesn't want to say something like if someone is being a certain way like prejudiced against her in some kind of way she won't say anything about it she'll just take it and work harder grit her teeth and work harder and then bryce goes and you know tries to defend defend juniper and help her and then you can see like juniper is already experiencing blowback and comments from people from doing that which she never mm -hmm. wanted to do and i would be the same way i'm i'm yeah. i'm a juniper in this situation i mean <laughs> i i understand junipers but i also yeah. understand i think where bryce was coming from she didn't want to yeah. like she saw her friend was being hurt because like people weren't sticking up for her, I guess. I like when Bryce is trying to call Juniper and Juniper's not answering the phone. And so she's like calling Fury and like the first words out of Fury's mouth is you fucked up. <laughs> she's like, I know. <laughs> I enjoy Fury, this book, because like you see like not a softer side of Fury, but like a reason behind Fury being the way she is like She's still not soft at all, right? Like, but you see, I don't know, a different dimension when she's with Juniper than you mm -hmm. have in the and and I I adore it. Like she's like, I'm gonna burn the world down for Juniper. I yes, I'm hoping that we get that. Mm -hmm. Ever since you've like brought up that scene again, I'm like, I hope we get that down at the meat market. Like, I hope we get a an Imran kind of scene where it's like, you done pissed off the wrong person. Yes. But so we figure out the bone quarter is kind of like, eh, nobody's there. Like we find out about second light, right? Mm -hmm. Um, which is basically like, instead of going to a heaven type place that everybody thinks that they're going to, when they like make it to the bone quarter, they are going to like, like a slaughterhouse, basically, of their souls are being sucked into second light and no longer existing anywhere for the rest of eternity. Like they're just being used as like little batteries 
for Second Life. Which <clears throat> this is what kind of initiates Ethan freaking out and being very concerned about Connor. Because then we see Ethan, like, he learns that Hypaxia is a necromancer. So he goes to Hypaxia and begs her to let him get in touch with Connor to make sure he's okay. And she's like, okay, but we have to wait until the uh, autumn equinox because that's when the veil between the living and the dead is the thinnest. And so we can do it then. Which, funnily enough, the autumn equinox is also when the Comidium holds like an annual ball, which is such a fun (laughs) scene for a variety of reasons. We find out some things. We do find some things, but I don't know if we've talked about the whole Agent Daybright and Rune thing. So Carmack enlists Rune to be able to like start communicating with this anonymous agent that's working on the rebel side, passing information along and then giving that to Cormac so that he can plan accordingly. And so, you know, in the background of this book, there's still the rebel Ophian war going on. So you have Pippa who's making all these strategic moves and bringing the war to their continent and their city Lunathion. And then you have Rune playing Mr. James Bond-ish in this in-between realm, getting very up close and personal with someone named Daybright. So you want to talk a little bit about how this goes? And falling for Daybright. So like it is mentioned, (laughs) I think the like initial parts of this were mentioned in the first half of the book, but Mm -hmm. it is mentioned that he knows the smell of this person. Like he has met this person and we were trying to figure out who he has met that this person could be and a mind was blown when we figured out who this person was because it's not anybody that was on my radar at all Mm -mm. but it totally makes sense yes so so we see him falling for this person and they even have a spicy scene right yeah um (laughs) where they're like I don't like I envisioned it like they're like their mental like it was almost like virtual yeah yeah sex with one it was like a hologram is what I was picturing (laughs) (laughs) their Uh holograms had sex and so we see her like disappearing all the time because this guy is like ripping her out and like and she keeps mentioning that like it's consensual but he likes pain basically he likes inflicting pain yes Yes, and so Ruin is getting more and more beside himself because I'm fairly certain that this is his mate, right? He is, like, picked up on this, right? And um, so he is, A, jealous that his mate is sleeping with somebody else, but B, mad that this guy is, like, hurting her, right? And so um, then they have their little sex scene, and he, like, I feel like he even tells her that, like, he's falling for her. I I don't remember, but... Yeah, I forget what his words were. He's like, I know you'll be there because you are high up in this dairy. So, like, let's meet at this fountain. And so he goes to meet and, like, the harpy and the hind are there, I think. And he, he's like, he's like, oh, okay, let's leave because, like, I don't want to get her in trouble. Like, I don't want her to get caught. And so he kind of just walks off. And then when they talk later that night, she's like, yeah, I saw them. Like, that's why I didn't show up either. And let's just, like, forego this because I think this is a bad idea. It was such a huge bummer moment for him because he spends the whole two weeks not really talking to Daybright the whole time. She's very, Uh you know, out of pocket. And so there's all this buildup and then so much shit is happening at the ball. Like, you have Bryce showing up on Cormac's arm, but then she goes rogue her and Hunt, and is just like to her father and the Asteri who tuned in virtually again, like, oh yeah, Hunt is my mate, and like puts it all out there. So Hunt is now a prince by association, like a consort to her. Because her father had previously said that like, you've been using the princess name, which makes you a princess. I've went ahead and changed all of your documents to say Princess Bryce. What's her last name? Dannon. Dannon. And she is pissed. She's like, I am not a Dannon. <laughs> she is so pissed and she's so upset with herself for falling right into his trap from all of the little instances that she pulled this little title trick. Mm-hmm. The other thing that she used her title on is, um, we haven't mentioned this, but Ethan, when he was going back to save the mystic and then finds out that she's a wolf, he stole the rings that included the little, like, sprites. 
And so he let them out. And so then they had to try and figure out a reason that they should be able to keep the fire sprites. And the other thing that was released, which was a dragon, right? And so to do that, Bryce is like, well, let's use our like royal decrees and say that we need them for protection and so that's what they did and that was the like final straw for her dad he's like oh you've used it twice come on you are Mm -hmm. now officially a princess this was the part that tara texted me about that she absolutely loved just the visual of walking into the guy's house the frat house essentially that they live at and then it's just like three little you know, naked little fire sprites sitting around the guys and then this dragon woman. I also really, like, I think the dragon is Flynn's mate. With the way he is acting, (laughs) I'm like, this has got to be his mate. Like, he is so territorial over her. It is so funny, his, like, personality being territorial. Didn't she kind of remind you of, like, Nesta? She reminded me of Nesta being very... Feisty, closed off, and, like, you can tell that she probably feels something for Tristan, but she just has a wall up, just like Nesta did. She also reminded me of Manon, because Manon did that with Dorian, too. Like, Mm -hmm. she's like, I'll give you what I'm willing to give you, but, like, there will be no feelings, kind of a thing. And so, like, I think the dragon is, like, enjoys Tristan, but isn't willing to, like, fall victim to another slavery, which is the main bond, just out of slavery. She's very much looking at the world as, I can't depend on anyone, so I'm going to go ahead and make my plans to make sure I can help myself, which her name is Ariadne. So very much the Nesta Manon vibes. And I I have a feeling we're going to grow to absolutely love her character once we see more of her. That is also a Greek mythology name of a person that was enslaved. There's so much buildup going on. I'm like, what is about to happen? <laughs> I I truly enjoyed that connection, which we do see. She, she kind of sells herself into slavery, but by her own choice to the Viper Queen. And so every fight that she does for the Viper Queen goes to paying off her debt. So basically mm-hmm. like what Quinlan was doing, Bryce. And she's like, this is a slavery that I get to choose. And so this is what I'm going to do. And so you see her disappear and then show back up the Viper Queens. She disappeared at the first opportunity to. That's what pissed Tristan off because like they had one job. Hypaxia was so nervous because the witch coven is, there's a lot of murmurings that things are going to happen. Kind of like a coup on the witch side because Mm -hmm. Hypaxia is the named queen And so there's all of this rumor that they're going to try and overthrow her and install someone else. So Hypaxia goes to our group of friends and is like, hey, can you get me a security detail? And so they put like Ethan on it, basically just a bunch of sunball meatheads, right? (laughs) Like, I don't know if they have actual like security (laughs) experience. Well, it was like Ethan and the dragon were the two main ones, right? Yeah. And poor Ethan, like, first chance, like, gets his little throat torn out. And he's like, I'm so horrible at this. Don't you just, I feel so much for Ethan. Like, he has lost so much. And he He, has been, like, so good not trying to interfere with Bryce's happiness and her relationship with Hunt. Like, he refuses to say anything about it, doesn't want to negatively impact anything. So he just keeps everything inside. And I'm like, my baby boy, I want you to be happy. And bad things keep happening to him. Like, like, when he was protecting... Um, Hypaxia, she went on a walk with Bryce and got attacked by this like death slayer or death stalker or whatever. Uh-huh. And um, they end up killing the demon, but he is like down for the count. Like the first chance it got, it just like ripped his throat out, right? And he's dying and they're like trying to save themselves, but also get to him fast enough that Hypaxia can like med witch him. And so he is left healing in Hypaxia's like, like consulate. I don't know what you want to call it, but embassy. And he is feeling bad about himself and he's thinking about the wolf that he left behind and stuff, which did you get vibes off of him and the wolf? Mm -hmm. Okay. I got mate vibes. Mm -hmm. Like that was part of the reason he wanted to go back and he like couldn't get it off of his mind is like he felt a pull to her. I forget what he said she smelled like, but it was like 
pine and embers or something like that. Like, and that's what the prime also says. Like, did she smell like this and that? And he's just like, yeah, very much made vibes. And I'm like, yes. I want this so badly for him. Like he, he needs something to go his Especially way. Especially if he is an alpha and she is the Fendir heir, like they could make a superpower alpha couple, right? Can you imagine what a way to make like Danica proud and, and mm-hmm. fix and all Connor. the shit that Sabine has done? Mm-hmm. Connor too. So you you see all of that happening at the same time that Bryce is trying to figure out like what the fuck is Dusk Truth and Project Thur. And so you get like a climactic scene later in the book with that. But back to the sorry, I forgot. There are more things that happen at this party. So right? many things like with Therian. <laughs> yeah. Who brings the River Queen's daughter and then and just then- continues just standing on the sidelines with her while this is her first time out and she wants to experience the ball and he's just like i'm not gonna dance with you and gets like some rando to dance with her and doesn't and then he goes, sleep with the rando yeah he goes to the bar and starts flirting with like a leopard shifter and then ends up sleeping with the leopard shifter and it's like come on man he just left the river queen's daughter there he definitely has fuck boy like Yes. Oh my God. Yes. Like so hardcore. So hunting Bryce is coming out. Celestina. Yeah. Celestina is like, oh, cool. That's great. Like, I I like this. I'm all for this. And so does Asteri. And so Bryce's dad can't say jack crap. Like it's already been approved. Like you, you have no no wiggle room in this. So he has to accept it, which is what Bryce and Hunt were angling at. And so basically, Cormac is pissed because like he was not informed that this was happening, and this was his like guys to be here to find a meal, right? And so he gets very pissed. We also see another love connection as Bryce and Hunt are sneaking off to get get some action um they sneak into a room that is occupied already they're like oh the door's locked we're just gonna barge in yeah like Like, we can break it no big deal and they walk in on hypaxia and celestina and basically celestina is like yeah the reason i hooked her up with rune is because like i wanted her here and protected i had good feelings about celestina before but i have even better because like i like hypaxia i think hypaxia is down for the cause of humans getting like everybody should be equal right and if hypaxia and celestina are in this kind of a relationship and one that has been going on for quite a while celestina is probably also on that wavelength and so everything that she's been saying about shahar and being friends with her and being down for that like you get more of a this was how she truly felt Mm -hmm. because i know this whole time she's been saying that and hunt's like i don't know if i can believe her Mm mm-hmm Celestina, I like her, but she also teeters on a very fine line, too, Mm -hmm. because there's that fine line between, you know, the villain saying that they will fuck everybody else if it saves the person they love. And we see some decisions that Selena or Celestina makes toward the end, like to protect Hypaxia. She throws other people under the bus, too. So it's like that fine line there, too. So doesn't Hypaxia remind you of Nehemia from Throne of Glass? Like a little... I also get that from Juniper. Yes. It's like a mixture, right? Mm -hmm. It's just like they're so intelligent and well-spoken and they carry themselves with such grace. And because we saw the scene where Hypaxia was like dreading meeting her sister because she's never met the hind face to face. And so Rune is like, well, you know, do you want me to accompany her? And this is like 10 minutes before midnight when he's supposed to go meet Daybright at the fountain. And he's like, okay, yeah, I'll go with you. And so, of course, the hind is standing over next to Pollux at the party, and they go over there, and the hind is just being very cold and detached, and Pollux is being, you know, an asshole and sneering at Hypaxia and stuff. And it's just, Hypaxia just, no one is on her level because she is so good and so kind, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And so you feel bad for her, too. Yeah, I hope we get to see a Celestina burning the world down moment oh tara tara wants that celestina villain origin (laughs) well like fury like i hope fury and celestina and bryce and like our our group burn it Mm -hmm. 
but I, I want to see Celestina like not like straddle the line, but like really like, no, I'm with her. You've, yeah. you've screwed up by going after her or whatever, you know, like, I want to see that. Like, I feel mm-hmm. like we're, we're going to get that with Fury in the meat market. Like it's going to happen, but I want to see that for Celestina too. I want her to get off the fence. Yes, exactly. With Hypaxia and Juniper, like, and, and Celestina, it's like, they're so kind and sweet to everyone all the time. You want to see them get down and dirty and like, mm-hmm. just stick up for something and just yeah. do something. It's kind of like how I feel about Elaine. Like everyone shits on Elaine from Akatar because she has not really done anything, but I feel like there's so much just boiling under the surface. Oh, it's always see. the quiet ones. Like you, you push them past their point. <laughs> It's like a volcano. And it's it's like a volcano and scorched earth. Like, there is no (laughs) coming back from this. Like, you are going to get, like, your ass handed to you because you pushed the quiet one too far. We're on the same page. We're like, we're so ready for this. Like, Mm -hmm. all the nice, quiet girls, we're ready. Come on. Yes. Show us. Yes. (laughs) Yes. So, we make it through the party. (laughs) Somehow. Um, And... Hunt and Bryce are still blue ballsing it because they can't (laughs) get it together. I think that there was a comment, like, I think I may have texted you this. This is why I can't text you because I can't remember, like, what I've actually said during this or what I've texted. (laughs) But there's a point where, like, Isaiah is looking over Hunt's phone and, like, Bryce had changed his, like, like, her, her name in there to like Bryce Quinlan sucks my dick like a champ or something like that <laughs> um and Isaiah's like oh oh okay <laughs> like, like I'm I'm sure you didn't do that and he's like no it's an inside joke and he's like uh-huh mm-hmm, it is it's totally sounds like an inside joke type of thing yeah I mean it kind of is but like Hunt that part so was not <laughs> Um, Hunt is so funny trying to be subtle. And then, like, he makes the comment about, like, somebody laughing at his blue balls. And I think it was Isaiah again. <laughs> and so I just, I love this, like, they're trying so hard to get together and everything is against it. Like, mm-hmm. like they keep mm-hmm. hitting roadblocks. And it's quite comical to me. The second half of the book, because the first half is so much of like trying to track down what Sophie was up to, what Danica knew, where this Emil boy is. And so Bryce has already put it together by this point. She is like a little Aelin Ash River Galathinius. She is a little Selena Sardothian. She knows exactly what's going on. She's like picking up on little subtle comments and stuff from like the Viper Queen. And she's enacting plans like Aelin yes. did, like without yes. telling anybody that this is a plan. She's like, and Hunt gets mad at her for this when he figures out what she did. And she's like, well, a lot I of people trust get you. mad at Bryce. Mm-hmm. She's like, I couldn't trust that you would be interested in the boy and not the power. Which. You got to love Bryce for that because she's always watching out for the underdog, like the mm-hmm. ones that need help. Well, because she's been that. Like mm-hmm. she's half human. So she has been that and she's not been accepted by the people in power and things like that. And so I think that calls back to her. The scene where she like reveals what happened with Emil and like set up the adoption through her own parents and all of this and Hunt sees the magnitude of everything he did and he starts getting like teary eyed and his eyes burning he's like what the fuck is going on like why are my all eyeballs wet right now (laughs) and like it was just all the feels in that scene he's like why am I leaking water yeah and like Emil has like survived years in a death camp he's starved he's like grown he's like almost i think he is a teenager but he's He's like like been so deprived of nutrients and stuff he's just like all skin and bones and a life and love like i know sophie loved him like i mean she gave her own life for him which we discovered Mm -hmm. like sophie is in fact dead like they didn't make it fast enough and you asking what that little rock was that little rock was a beacon for the um queen of the ocean right they have like these little like it's gonna sound really bad but like i envision like the octonauts octonauts to your stations right like the little <laughs> oh <kid> my god <laughs> i mean i like can see it though as that, a like, mom has everything i can see it <laughs> right like like an adult version of the octonauts ship right so like like 
they save them from, I think it's Pippa, right? Mm-hmm. And the hind. I think the hind showed up to that too, right? Okay, so sorry. Back up. Um, so like <laughs> our group goes to like make an attack on a part of the spine, right? Yeah, they're doing a little espionage and espionage and sabotage. Pippa is there and she goes to kill, like she kills like the people that were helping them, right? And so Cormac and all of our team are like, what the hell? Like those people were on our side. Why are you killing them? And Pippa's like, well, oh well. Because um, they're not human. Yeah. And then we see like the hind and that group show up. So our group has to escape. And so they go into the water and like the queen's ship finds them. Right. And these little stones are little beacons for this ship. And everybody thought that it was Bryce's light that drew them, but it was this little beacon. And we find out that the stone that the hind dropped was a beacon for somebody to save Sophie. The hind is just like, when you figure out that the little stone that she dropped in the prologue too with like Sophie, like she did not want to kill Sophie. She mm-hmm. had to make it appear that way, but she did everything in her power that she possibly could to try and to save. help Sophie. And, and the Ocean Queen submarine was just like too late Mm -hmm. and so you see like all of these little pieces like tara talks about these characters giving up pieces of themselves all the time like hind i don't know how long she has been with this crew and having to put off this very heartless cold torture facade but she even in her interactions with rune she makes a comment like you make me want to be a person again like you make me want to live again type which by the way we have not told you yet but the hind is daybright so in her yeah. interactions with rune as daybright she is she is feeling more alive and like she can be her true nature mm-hmm. and not have to hide that she isn't this horrible human being or horrible veneer but yes yeah, so we see that that is dropped the queen comes or the queen's ship locked not ship comes and our crew is on there and they let us know that sophie is in fact dead and they have her body and so cormac goes to visit it and you can tell like sophie was so close to cormac he was in love with her and he is not himself anymore were they mates i don't know if they ever said no it didn't ever say but i think so like i don't think that sophie ever accepted that Mm -hmm. but i think that they were and so he rightfully so like just he spent like days in this morgue with her body like just talking to her basically when cormac got mad at bryce like i understood why he did like Mm -hmm. he's been trying to help and he's been so transparent about being a part of the rebellion and all of the things that he's been doing well, and I, he was so transparent about, like, this is my way of being here to help Emil. And then yeah. after that happened, after he knew that Sophie was dead, he knew, like, he had to save Emil because that was her dying, like, wish for him. And he mm-hmm. had no other way of honoring the love he had for her besides making sure Emil survived. Right. Yeah. And so I think that that hit him twofold because they don't understand that this is the sacrifice he wants to make to honor the love he had for her. Yeah. And they're hiding it. And then also they're like thwarting this by doing this. Like he could have worked around it had he known ahead of time. Like he's not going to stop them from doing it, but he could have like made an excuse or like. Yeah. Done some sort of like spy magic to keep it going. And so now he feels like they just undermined his like being able to hunt for a meal. He's having to do so much behind the scenes too, because I don't get a really good vibe from like who his father is too. I mean, his father Mm -mm. sounds just like Rune's father. And there was a very touching scene between Rune and Cormac at the bar after so much shit has happened. And they're having a conversation. Cormac is like very lost in his thoughts, having Uh a few drinks and Cormac turns to Rune and is just like, he almost expresses that he's so envious of Rune. And Rune's mm-hmm. just like, why would you be envious of me? And he's like, well, because you didn't let your father break you. I let mine, you know, break me. And it was just such a sad scene. Like in that moment, I felt so much sadness for Cormac. But looking like outside, I know he feels like he let his father break him. But like looking at what Cormac is doing, 
Like, I don't think he actually let his father break him. He is somebody that his father would hate, yeah. right? And he's choosing to be that somebody for whatever reason. And I mean, I think the reason is love because he mm-hmm. loved Sophie. But he is choosing to be a person that he knows his father would hate. So I don't think his father broke him. I know yeah. it feels like that to him. So I'm not undermining that. But like, as a third party looking in, like, I think he, his father may have steered some of his because he didn't want to be like his father some yeah. of his decisions but i don't think he's broken but you see that he went into the next day with that kind of attitude because he kind of just went like all out like no plan b this is what i'm yeah. going to sacrifice type of thing and that that makes me sad <laughs> yes Which we've kind of glossed over the fact of like what all this is like so the rebellion happening they go to that island to get the weapons and to see what their mech suit technology is looking like Mm -hmm. does these mech suits can just channel energy directly from first light and power up it's like brimstone missiles without having to be fired off like just on a suit that regular human can wear or the time frame because don't they take like a long time to create like the brimstone ones Uh Uh-huh. And so they go there to see all of this new tech to destroy it. And then they're escaping. Oh, they do see Baxian because Baxian is like in his little wolf Wolf or hound form. And it's just like motioning to them. And they're just like leaving the island at that point. But he was trying to warn them about the hind coming. But we didn't even talk about some stuff that happened on the ship too, because we do see that they retrieve Sophie's body too late. That's why the chains were empty. We don't see the body, though. I kept waiting for them to describe the hand like missing fingernails or something, which they never did. But Cormac touched her body. Yes. And you would think that he knows. I, I, I'm i just like... Oh. You're just hoping Sophie's alive. I'm, I'm hoping something happens because we still didn't ever get any closure from Victoria being sucked out of her body, shoved into a box, and sent to the bottom of the ocean, too. Mm-hmm. So I'm like... Or Justinian. Really? He he ended up dying. Crucified, I know, but maybe. like, but we didn't get any closure from his death. It was just kind of like, oh, he's dead. Yeah. Victoria can't just be like still in a box at the bottom of the equivalent of, you know, Mariana Trench or something. Yeah. Right. But we we also get a, a slightly happier scene on that boat, which is like <laughs> um, Hunt and Bryce get it on, like to the point that like. Bryce ends up te- like teleporting for the first time <laughs> because their their energies like mesh, right? And so she mm-hmm. ends up teleporting them to a different area. And she's like, uh, where are they we? They go from like a garden biodome to coming to in an airlock just out for anyone to be able to see them if they happen to walk by. <laughs> and I love like Rune's reactions to like their sex life because he's like, gross. Gross. Like, um, which is hilarious to me because you know Rune isn't like celibate, and and his sister has had to live with that, and he's like now just gross that my sister. No, we know he's not celibate because we didn't even talk about this. Like the first was it the first part? Yeah, the first part, chapter three, when he was like Rune Dannon knew. With absolute certainty, like, three things. And it was, like, the first one was, like, he was so high off Mirthrude, he couldn't feel his face, which was a shame because there was a fawn sitting on it, right? (laughs) At this party. (laughs) It was, like, oh, I I love him so much. He's just that rebellious prince. (laughs) Yes. Um, You do enjoy the rebellious princes. I do. Like, Like, I'm a a Dorian Dorian. girl. Um, I'm a Dorian girl. But so after Cormac like gets blindsided by them at the party, he is he is mad. Like so the next day he lets them know and he's like, What other secrets are you keeping from me? And Bryce is like, None, none, don't look at my face, like none. And so it kind of gets let out of the bag that she knows where Emil is and that he is safe. And she tells Cormac that. And she's like, He is safe. He needs to stay where he is. Like, he has no powers. Nobody needs to be looking for him. He has no powers. And they're all like, but Sophie said, and she's like, Sophie lied to make it to where somebody would have interest in saving her her brother. But he is safe. And I, I'm with you. I adore that he goes to her parents because, like, you get, like, a little note back 
about him going on these little walks with like her dad, Randall. And I'm like, this little boy is going to be so loved. Mm hmm. Yeah. He needs some love. He has a lot of catching up to do mm-hmm. to make so him I feel like that. a human being again. Yeah. Ugh. All the feels in that scene. Cormac, it's like, I wanted him to be happier about Emil having a happy ending, but you can't help but feel like Cormac probably, I mean, he was supposed to protect. <laughs> That's his one promise to Sophie was I'm going to protect Emil and he lost him. Like he couldn't do that. And so for him, it's still probably like a failure. Well, I don't think it's so much a failure. I like, yes, he would have liked to to have done it, but he brought the people in that then protected. True. I don't know if he saw it that way. No, but did you get the sense that he just gave up at that point? Yes. Like yeah. when he knew Emil was safe, like I got the sense that he just like gave up. Like, I don't mm-hmm. want to be alive anymore, which shows up the next day, which is why, to me, I think that that was, in fact, Sophie's body. Ooh, yeah, that's Because Cormac point. just gave up, and I don't think he would have given up if there was any hope any. Yeah. that Sophie was still alive. That's a great point. However, we do have a necromancer, but they mentioned that the person doesn't come back the same, like, at all. It's, like, they're not with their soul, but, like, I was hoping that they would come back normal. Uh-huh. I have so many questions about how the necromancy works. I'm like, so does the body still retain like its powers? Like for her, would it be if she was reanimated somehow, Mm -hmm. would she be able to have like Thunderbird power? Would somebody else be able to inhabit her body? Well, it mentioned in the book that yes, they do come back with their powers. And that's why like they don't like the necromancers. And that's why the necromancers Mm -hmm. have been sought like death basically, Mm -hmm. because they could create an army of like, veneers that didn't have their souls so they were like not sentient and so they could make them do whatever they wanted them to do with their powers yeah so it's a lot like the vol creating like the little like rings taking away their like not abilities to do magic but like taking away their like ability to do what they want with their magic yes the rings the collars even like the mask that Nesta wears in Silver Flames commanding the dead, like maybe they would just get raised up like that Mm -hmm. and just, who knows? I don't know. I'm very interested to see where this goes. That is what it seemed like to me because it mentions that they don't come back in control of themselves. Yes. But if it's Hypaxia bringing them back, like I feel like she would then be like, you're free. I just feel like Hypaxia has to be so comfortable talking to all things just scary and spooky because you learn a little bit about her past, which was like, oh, yeah. So those teachers that taught me like all these they're ancient ghosts. things, they were dead people. <laughs> like My they, mother had kind of, them like trapped, basically. <laughs> I'm like, oh, she raised them cool. from the dead, trapped them at the estate. And they were my teachers and best friends. And it's like, oh, bless your heart, Hypaxia. You <laughs> had such a... The kooky little upbringing. It's like Wednesday Adams, like. Yes. Welcome to Ophelia Hall. Not a hugger. Got it. Please excuse Wednesday. She's allergic to color. Oh, wow. What happens to you? I break out into hives and then the flesh peels off my bones. I'm interested to see more about that. I want to go back to the fire sprites because, first off, I love them because they have a little bit of that Lihaba kind of mm-hmm. sassiness to them. And they're like just fawning over the boys all the time at the this house, you know. But there was that moment where they where Bryce was talking about, or was it Rune? No, Rune was talking about like, because Lihaba was special to him too. And he was sharing how Lihaba always claimed to be the descendant of like Queen ranthia or something like that and they were like what like they acted so shocked like she was an actual like descendant of that person there are so few of them left anyway and was trying to say like bryce should meet like their queen who is owned by the asteri like one of the asteri Mm -hmm. so i'm like i'll be interested to see where that goes Mm -hmm. and then we also learned that ariadne one of the things that's so terrifying about a dragon is her fire can like seriously injure, if not like kill Asteri. So we will see. And the like princess of hell, right? Oh yeah. The princess of hell. Maybe that's what it was. Yeah. Princess of hell. But there's like so much turmoil. Like that's where it starts getting confusing with the world building because like 
apparently long, long ago, like thousands and thousands of years ago, some fae and shifters came over to this world, but also there was like the Asteri here who were trying to farm the planet for energy because that's how they they're leeches and parasites which is they need. what we find out like later on because bryce and hunt and ruin go to like the eternal city right oh yeah at the same time cormic and therian and i think those two go to create a diversion and mm-hmm. therian had previously made a very bad decision because he basically tells the River Queen's daughter, like, fuck off. I'm never going to Dude is so you. dumb. Um, he pissed and, me off so bad. And in doing so, she's like, fine, I'm going to go tell my mom. And so he's like, oh, I've got, like, very limited time to, like, do something about this. And so he goes and sells himself to the Viper Queen. So we have Ariadne and Therian now sold to the Viper Queen. And he's like, but before I, like, go into my debt with you, can I help my friends with this? So he goes and makes, a, like, a, a diversion for them to draw away some of the Asteri because they are going to go try and find this room that Sophie caught onto and visited. And carved. She carved the cereal into her arm. And isn't it Baxian that tells him what this code is? Mm-hmm. Because he's like, oh, I know that code. And they're like, how did you know that code? And he's like, well, because I'm Danica's mate. And that's how they all find out that, like, Danica had a mate and that it's the hellhound, right? And everything's starting to make a little more sense with the timelines for Danica. And so anyway, so they're going into this rune room. And Rune and Hunt are trying to find Daybright, who had been kidnapped, right? And they're trying to find her. At the same time, Bryce is like, well, I'll just go into the room and see what I find. Well, what she finds is basically First Light is a battery powering the Asteri. So they are like little leeches sucking like power off of other people. So she is now set on that. And then there's another room that she goes into, right? She saw rooms like midday, midnight. Oh, she's like, oh, a dusk room. I'm going to go in there. (laughs) So she finds out way more which is like the planetary things and a history of like their conquering of other worlds other plans what right? happened yeah and so she is like going through this trying to find like her planet and figuring out like information so anyway so you see all of that you see a few other planets that sound familiar right uh-huh um and then she goes to go back to ruin and um, hunt and finds them in chains yeah rune well rune's down in the dungeons because his last hint from daybright was like her mumbling off like dungeons or something and so he's like shit i have to go to the dungeons to save her so he goes off rogue and then hunt sticks around waiting for bryce because she's taking longer because she keeps going down the rabbit hole to learn more and then once she finally gets back hunt is like chained up with the magic nullifying binds by is it not Mordok? Who's the other one? Is it not Pollux? The Harpy? I can't remember. I can't remember who imprisoned who. Like Rune runs into Mordok, I think, in the dungeons. But like I forget who got Hunt. Maybe it was like Harpy. Which is or something. interesting because like we find out that the Hind is Daybright in this scene, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. Mordok was her like second in command. So it's interesting that he is the one like guarding her at this point. Mm-hmm. Can we talk about Rune's reaction to finding out Daybright is Hind? Yeah, he doesn't I felt handle bad it for well. her. No, he doesn't. He um He's like, you're dead all- to me. We thought his reaction to like it possibly being Harpy, you know, at the ball was bad, but like once he for sure finds out that it's Hind, it's like he forgets all the good stuff that mm-hmm. she had been talking about and working towards and all the ways that she opened up to him, and he's just like disgusted and like looking down down upon her Mm -hmm. he's having a hard time but yeah i mean shit escalated very quickly once they got to the eternal city which they find out you know celestina was feeding their behaviors and what they were doing and where they were and what they were looking into directly to the asteri so the asteri made plans was it celestina i thought it was mordok it was was the one following them around it was both but they do say that celestina was like 
reported back to where they were like poking around and, you know, mm-hmm. oh, they weren't at where they were supposed to be. Um, and so she was kind of doing that too, but like it came from a good place, right? Like she didn't know, I don't think she knew what the repercussions of that would be. So all this shit happens. They played right into this theory's hand and it gets to a point where, so Cormac is dead. Therian just runs off. Cormac's like, I'm just going to blow this shit up. Like you just run. And Therian gladly runs. Again, fuck boy. No, fuck boy. But I don't know if he's really himself anymore because when he struck a bargain with the Viper Queen, he had to bite and suck her blood or venom or whatever's inside her body. I'm mm-hmm. not convinced that she's just a regular shifter. Vogue. Because that blood oath to the Vogue kind of thing. Yes. And it's very similar to like how the River Queen is acting. They just seem like they're very like the River Queen and Viper Queen seem like they're very single minded in like trying to get power. Like mm-hmm. River Queen seems like she is about to start some shit with Ocean Queen, the other courts of the oceans and mm-hmm. waters, because they start talking about like ancient worlds and pathways to other worlds under the water and things like that, too. It's like shit is about to happen. The River Queen is holding her har- cards very close to her chest. She's obviously after something. Um, it's like desperate for something. So it's like Therian, she was so bad that Therian sold his soul to the Viper Queen to go to- get away from the River Queen. Like, mm-hmm. You hear, like, him talking about, like, earthquakes coming, like, the water just churning, like, when she's searching for him and he's, like, racing to make this deal with the Viper Queen. It's like, how much power does she have? Very foreboding. And then you you see, like, Hunts and Chains and both Ruin and Hunt are like, go, teleport out, jump through the gate, whatever, try and get somewhere safe. And she th- she's like, go oh, to well, hell. I'll just go to hell. And um, get them to, like, come and attack, basically. They're readying their armies. Yeah. Yes. And the, they'll they'll fight for me, right? And so that's where she attempts to go. But that is not where she ends up. And she ends up in this, like, little meadow kind of thing, right? And she's like, oh, there's grass and hail. And, and she's like, this and is And a peaceful weird. river. <laughs> yeah. yeah. She's like, this is not what I envisioned. And then some guy comes up and he's, like, talking in a foreign language to her. She's trying to get him to take her to Adis, and he he doesn't understand what she's saying. And so he blindfolds her and picks her up with his hurt hands, like his scarred hands, and takes her to a house. And she's like, oh, they have tea in hell. And she's just like, this is hell. Like, take me to my place. Um, (laughs) Hell is weird. A lot different than I thought. And so in walks a little little lady and like she's like oh well maybe they speak the old language of fey and so she talks and the lady's like that hasn't been spoken here for like thousands of years and but then they start talking or whatever and then in walks another couple one with paint on her and i'm like oh my god that's (laughs) um and it is and the man introduces himself in the old language as resand and she, when she sees him, she's like, Rune? And so this is like Rune's twin, which is weird to me crazy? that she would think that because Rune is described as having longer hair and like like the etches in his hair. And that's not what I pictured for recent. Like I pictured like floppy, like frat boy hair. I mean, she's just seeing like tawny golden skin violet blue eyes Mm -hmm. and like dark hair and just like holy shit like you are somehow related to him yeah um (laughs) she probably thinks he's like a prince of hell and because they have the like shadows you do get the sense that they could be avalon Uh uh-huh uh-huh and avalonian is that what we're calling them i don't know avalon a-v-a-l-l-e-n yeah avalon yeah anyway so that's where we freaking end, right? There like, wasn't there was an epilogue, but it's basically just Ethan like standing watch over, over this the... alpha wolf because we see uh who is it? Amelie poking around doing Sabine's business. And then we get like uh Declan and Tristan calling him and they're like, get over here now, shit went down. No, because Declan's, like, sitting behind the camera, like, watching all this shit happen inside, like, the Asteri's crystal palace. And and he's like, well, I've got to stay here. And they're like, no, you're our brother now. Get over here. I'm so glad Ethan has a home. And so he's torn between, like, the wolves who have, like, 
turned him out and the people who like cared. But then he goes, doesn't he? He takes the wolf and then goes. He's like, yeah. I'm not leaving her here. Like yeah. they're already poking around trying to get to her. I'm taking yeah. her. So he like abducts her. So there's gonna, there's so much shit. Like I can't wait to see what happens. Mm-hmm. So we know that there's a connection now in Akatar and Crescent City. And I have a feeling there's a connection to Throne of Glass too. Yes. And I want a Throne of Glass, like Aelin Galathinius, like Aiden, Manon, all of the people, all of the like baddies from Akatar and Bryce and her little group. I want them all converging to just like be like, fuck you to the Asteri, because we've seen that the Asteri has done this to multiple planets and that they're like the six that are here are not the only six. So, like, I feel like the six that are here, like, are just a few of what has happened. They're like these migrating aliens that mm-hmm. just feast on planets. It'll be interesting to see. What do you make of um, the whole Thea and Peleus lineage? Like, what happened with her? They say two daughters. They've only really talked about Helena, but there was another daughter. So Bryce has to be. Well, yeah, Bryce has to be the other daughter's descendant because she's got the power of Thea. Right? Mm-hmm. And Adis was in love with, with Thea. Thea, yeah. Which I think is part of the reason, like, some of the people sided with Hell over the Asteri, which is how we got to where we are now, because they knew what was going on with the Asteri. Like, they knew that the Asteri is, like, this not cool bosses. This prophecy of when sword and knife are reunited, so shall our people mm-hmm. be. The sword and the knife are now reunited because, like, who was it that recognized Amran? I'm thinking is the character that didn't give her name. She was like, that's Gwydion, which Gwydion was tossed into the ocean by that queen who couldn't use it, right? And then it, like, so that queen wasn't starborn, right? Mm-hmm. And so, like, the, like, connections in the waters, connections to other worlds comes in because I bet that that was how, like... When Rune went to find it, it was, like, in some water, right? Like, some, like, land and water and stock. Like, it's kind of like a King Arthur. Like, the Lady yes. of the Lake brings it up kind of thing. Uh-huh. So, yeah, I think that that is, like, your people are being reunited. Was it their choice to come to this planet? Or were they, like, kidnapped from their planets to then be farmed at this planet? Because right now we don't know, like, it's kind of been like, just like assumed by all the people that it was their choice. But like, were the people given a choice to come to this new planet? Or was it like a Noah's Ark kind of a thing? Like where the little aliens are like, we're going to take two from this planet, two from this planet, two from this place. And you're all going to come here and be our little slaves and power us. I think they were manipulated, right, into going through into this other world by the Asteri. Because the way that they talk about this misty isle in Akatar, where rumor is there might have been an eighth court called Dust Court, we don't know, but there's this mysterious isle where now we just have an old ass prison there that's very Mm -hmm. weird. But if you remember from Silver Flames, when Nesta went to go fetch uh, the harp from under the, the mountain part of it, And it was like, I feel like it was Gwyn who was singing and it was transporting Nesta to like under this mountain. She kept getting flashbacks from like an ancient time where these people were screaming and pounding against the cave like they were trapped inside the walls of this dungeon. So it's like, were these the people? Yeah, see, I don't think it was even a manipulation. I think that there was like a kidnapping situation. Mm, Yeah, and then maybe some made it through. Yeah, Probably, because the book made it seem like Thea kind of believed it and then found out too late and tried to go back, Mm -hmm. right? So it was like her daughter who went back to try and close all of the gates and ended up closing, like, the gates to hell, too. And I wonder if that daughter is maybe, like, a descendant in Akatar or even a descendant for Selena. Because we see Selena has a power of light, too. Mm Mm-hmm. You don't see anybody in Akatar besides, like, like the Autumn Court that have the power of, like, light, but it's not the same. It's, like, fire. No. Yeah, it's just straight fire. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, Hillian kind of. Helian is day. Uh-huh. And we know he's Lucian's real dad. Yeah. 
So he kind of has a light power because he, he breaks the like codes. And if I remember correctly, he broke those with the light, right? Like he had a yeah. light when he was breaking them. Mm-hmm. Curse breaking. Uh-huh. Yeah. So there's so know. much shit that's going to happen. I don't even yeah. know. And we, we've been having like all this discussion. So when we had Jesse from Jim was canceled over on the show and we were talking about Azrael ships and like, she's team Gwyn and Az. And I was like, I really want to see Elaine and Az hook up. And it's like, maybe I mean, he's met Bryce now. Like, does he go to their world? <laughs> like, you know, they're going to help. Who is left in the world? Like, that doesn't have a significant other already, though. Because are we are we thinking like you know Bryce throws Hunt over for him? Like because Bryce has already mated with Hunt, so even if they mm-hmm. weren't true mates, and like as is her true mate, is she just gonna leave Hunt and be like, oh, this is my true mate? Like I don't I don't necessarily think that. Or it depends on what happens with Hunt. Hunt is kind of kinky. It seems like maybe they share. <laughs> It depends on what happens with Han because they put the 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 collar back or the crown back crown on crown tattoo thing back on him and it was kind of like everything went blank for him. Oh, maybe that did reset the mating that they chose Who, to do. Like you know that they can fiddle with that from like what we've learned in other series and also like didn't the Asteri or Regulus make the comment that Hunt was bred? Like when Bryce was like figuring out all the stuff and talking to him. Yeah. And Hunt's dad is somebody uh-huh. like, and he mentioned that Thur was mm-hmm. the last person to like go up against them basically. Before Danica. And so I wonder if mm-hmm. he was bred, but like, why would they be breeding somebody that would go up against them? Like with significant Maybe powers? he was bred to track down someone else. Like demons? Demons or it's like, I feel like Midgard's definition of what d- demons are is probably very skewed because she's looking at all of these bat winged males in Prithian as demons. So it's like, are they actually demons? Like, is Adis actually a demon? Is Thanatos an actual demon? Is that like just the like night court members? <laughs> yeah, it's very interesting, right? You also find out like these angels are just the latest version of these experiments that they were doing to try and breed like this superior hunter type of thing and what we learned from akatar was that the illyrians came about in a very similar way mm-hmm. and the seraphim too they're like all slightly different variations of angels of these, like kind of uh-huh. things yeah it's gonna be interesting uh-huh like i have a thought because I forget who made the comment. It was during a previous Akatar episode. And we're like, how, why would Farah and Resand do this bargain? Like when you die, I die. Because wasn't the wording of the bargain that they struck, like we leave this world together. Mm-hmm. And so now I'm like, do Farah and Resand leave Prithian and go to Midgard? And that's how like their death bargain is fulfilled. I think everybody leaves like. But I don't know, because Prithian's the home planet, right? Like, that's where they came from. And it makes it seem like Well, no, I mean, for the war, I think everybody will leave. Like, I think we will have a big battle in Midgard against these Asteri. And then possibly an even bigger battle against, like, finding, like, when we find out where the Asteri's home planet is. Like, I think we will have everybody go to that planet and, like, kill. Which... Didn't Rigla say he couldn't even remember where their home planet was? It's been so That's long. why she was going through the book to try and figure uh. out where their home planet is. I have a feeling it's somewhere in that book. <laughs> their origin story. Yeah. The Asteri are definitely the Vogue, right? Like I don't know if they're the Vogue or if they're like they're very similar to the Vogue. I mean, they have to feed off these people's souls. The Vogue didn't like use it as like a battery, right? Like they were, they were able to be sentient and like not have to have somebody else's power to power them. I don't know. So I don't think they're like the Asteri currently, but like I think that they are a form of Asteri, right? Like I think that they are similar in that they go to different planets and like eat them, but it's a different kind. I have so many questions. There's just, Sarah has so much explaining to do. 
in the next book. I'm like, there's no way in like an 800 page book that she's going to be able to answer all of these questions. So we're going to have another book and you've made me read these early. And so now I'm going to have to wait two, two years for this early, early. It's like Throne of Glass has been done forever. And I know, but they're not complete series. (laughs) Hmm. We're still getting a television adaptation, aren't we? I think so, but I thought that that was like put on hold for a little while. Yeah, I thought it was delayed because of the writer strike stuff, mm-hmm. but I I thought I had read somewhere where it was still happening, which I don't know how this is going to play out like live action because there's so many intricate people. You know, you don't want it to look cheesy and cheesy. fake. Mm-hmm. And we have everything now. We have wyvern. We have dragons. We have fey. We have fey shifting into wolves. Mm-hmm. That could go horribly lo- wrong if you right, do your CGI wrong. wrong. Horribly wrong. That's why whenever years ago news broke out the Throne of Glass was going to be adapted and then it just, you know, disappeared. Pitter. And then they said they were adapting Akatar. I'm like, okay, I can live with that because of what's happened, you know, as of House of Sky and Breath. <laughs> yeah. Because maybe we'll get a little bit of everything, but who knows? So we'll see. Yeah. I feel like... Therian is not himself Mm -mm. and that something bad's going to happen real bad caused by Therian because it, it it even seemed like the river queen had taken over his mind, right? He has a tether back to her. You mean the Viper queen or yeah, the Viper queen. And like Bryce was even, or was it Ethan? Like someone was like, he smells different and he's Mm -hmm. acting really different. Like very. Yeah. I'm just, I'm worried for a group now. I hope no one dies. Well, Cormac already died, so. Mm. He already died. That was sad. Sophie's death was very sad, but I'm I'm happy about Emil. So. Yeah. And I thought it was cute that Fury had to be the one to drive him. (laughs) And wouldn't get him snacks. She's like, no. No, get him snacks, you bitch. (laughs) Aw. I liked Cormac, though. I'm sad. I did dead. like him. I grew to really like him. He was just a really interesting character because he, he was very morally gray, right? Mm-hmm. He, he was very troubled. Yeah. It made me sad. So we will see. Hopefully. Therian is just on my shit list now. Mm-hmm. So hopefully we will find out in the next book. The part I don't understand is like the Asteri, obviously, they win if all out war breaks loose on this world, right? Because their whole thing is getting their souls, their first light and their second light. So it's like, they don't really give a shit whether the human, the rebels and whatever fight. Mm -hmm. So it's like, is this war going to happen on top of like the Asteri problem? House of Flame and Shadow. I'm just like, all I've heard for sure is there's going to be three books in Crescent City. I haven't heard for sure that there's going to be a house of many waters. Maybe we'll figure out that a house of many waters isn't an actual house. Like you were saying, there's something weird with the River Queen. Yeah. Maybe we will find out that that is not, like it doesn't exist after this book or something. Yeah, maybe. Um, I was texting Tara about this because when we had done our Throne of Glass read along, it was the fourth read through of like Crown of Midnight or third read through. I picked up the part about Baba Yellowlegs telling Selena that waterways go lead to other worlds and stuff, which is also why I think that we're going to see like an Easter egg of that book that Cassian threw into the river, you know, Nesta's Christmas present. I think we're going to see it again at some point. There's just too much shit going on with the water and too much focus, like throwaway lines being it's placed. It's probably on in Jessaba's library. Dude, yes. I don't know what Jessaba is. I was like trying to think of something Greek mythology that she could possibly be, like some kind of record keeper, or she's she's not good, but she's not bad. She's just kind of neutral and like just keeps the histories and the records and stuff. So I'm like, I don't know what entity or figure does that, but that's what she strikes me as. Like but a Hermes know. kind of thing. He's like the messenger Maybe. god. So like she is like keeping the history and messaging people. Yeah. Hmm. It's interesting. Mm-hmm. I also just feel like we're going to have so many bombshells dropped on us on like who's whose father and mother and like with the Prince of Hells and stuff and Asriel. Like <laughs> we know. I wonder if Asriel and Hunt are brothers. Maybe that's what we find out. Because both of their fathers disappeared, right? Uh Uh-huh. Like, it's just not even talked about. It's like Zeus going around impregnating people. 
Oh, Ooh, and Zeus has lightning bolts. Yeah, everyone's like, oh, it's Thor. It's Thor. That's the parallel. But yeah, maybe it's Zeus. Like, and he went around impregnating people like nobody's business. So uh huh. maybe we'll see Hercules come in. Another one of the <laughs> brothers. Like, wasn't wasn't it Cassian? Didn't you already <laughs> draw that conclusion? <laughs> I mean, yes, but like maybe there's an yeah. actual Hercules coming. There's some shit that's going to go down because we learn from Throne of Glass that there are these gates that have been left guarded by like spiders that belong to the Vog, and that Throne of Glass had these black, you know, their dad could be Hades with the lightning bolts and like the like the shadows because we've already maybe. drawn the like the like. Persephone, Hades, kind of like a, a with connection. Elaine mm-hmm. and Azrael too. People don't like this ship, but I like this ship. We'll see. Maybe Azrael's Hades' son, and he's out there doing the same thing with Elaine. Didn't you see a lot of parallels with Azrael and Rune too? Because Rune mm-hmm. has like the scars on him too from his deadbeat dad. Our poor boys. They gotta earn their women. Apparently, they have to go through hell to. <laughs> Find some happiness. They got to go through hell to grow them up so that they're not Therian and little fuck boys. Uh huh. Maybe this is Therian's hell or his ordeal, as they call it. Um, Maybe. So that he's a better human or better person. Tara, I am trying to imagine Bryce walking around this fantasy land that's not modern and like, because you know her style is like just loud colors and glitter and, and sparkly very, things. Very um, sassy. Yeah. <laughs> and she's going to be in this world where it's like a step back and she's just like can't communicate with anyone. <laughs> I don't think she's going to be in that world for very long. You don't think so? No, she's going to find out. Like she's too worried about Ruin and... Punch. It's not like she's just gonna sit there and be like, oh, here's a tea party. Like, I'm she like is... who is she talking into going with her first back to Midgard? Oh, Amron. Like, who is you think Amron's gonna go? Oh, Amron, yeah. Amron doesn't have her powers anymore, though. She's like a regular normal person. She doesn't have now. her powers here. True. But maybe she would have her powers when she goes back to her home country, right? Like, she doesn't have her powers in this body, but if she goes somewhere else and, like, loses the body... Maybe she tries to go back to Midgard, and they end up in Aurelia and meet Aelin. (laughs) They just keep landing on the wrong planet, and then she's like, wait, there's shifters. We know Aelin can can do that, so maybe Aelin helps her learn how to get back to the right planet. Aelin still has a drop of power yet. Yet. Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Maybe. Because Aelin has has fallen through planets and made it back to her planet. So maybe Aelin is how she learns how to, like, figure out her way through the wormholes and end up back in Midgard. In Throne of Glass, there was lore about ancient times. There was these world walkers, right? So maybe, like, maybe Bryce or maybe our three main women are somehow world walkers or came from some kind of special god line that is able to do that. We don't know. Or even not, like maybe not our three main ones, but like maybe this is where Nesta comes in with her like special powers that I think you were right that what did you say what object the horn was part of Nesta? So maybe Nesta and her like calling to those dead troves will call to the horn and then it's going to be Nesta, Aelin, and Bryce, who are Ooh. all three very very similar people. Right? If Thera's a mom, she's not going to want to leave her baby boy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I so, wouldn't want to. So, like, Nesta, and I don't think anybody can stand up to those three. No. Like, God help you. Godspeed. Good luck. <laughs> I I, I want to see Bryce's face whenever she sees a Pegasus. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I'm imagining Helian just, like, all over himself flirting with her and trying to proposition her because that's what he does to everybody. But but Helian <laughs> also has the same color of hair. Like, so I wonder if we'll find out after he, like, propositions her that, like, she is somehow, like, Ew. related to him. <laughs> Ew. Ewie. <laughs> that would be Because icky. that sounds like Helian, and then he's like, oh, <laughs> damn, another one. Because he Remember- propositions his, like, son's mate a few times. Uh, and, like, uh-huh. Like- Cassian and more and Azrael like all yeah he's he doesn't care he's just like he's free. like who who will sleep with me who, who? <laughs> please 
Yeah. Somebody, somebody has to be willing to sleep with me, right? <laughs> Remember when we were talking about Kingdom of Ash and Alien, a- Alien, Alien had locked. <laughs> you did to me. I know. And now I did it. And Alien had talked about locking the gods, like mm-hmm. in some kind of hell realm. Well, what if something comes out of that? Too? Maybe those are like. Locked in the same place as Adis. Maybe that's why they want to come out. And they're like, these gods are driving me insane. They can have it. We want up here. I just, I I want to see all of this stuff. And I know I'm not going to get all of it because a book can only be so long. But hopefully we'll start seeing. We see it come out and it's like like a thousand, two thousand pages. I mean, like Sandra's going to get her. Last book is already like super thick. Look at that. It's like 800 pages almost three inches she writes some thick boys we'll see Mm -hmm. so hopefully you gave this episode a listen enjoyed some of our (laughs) theorizing and banter we are all over the place we've been it's like these books are so long and so much happens and there's so many main people in the cast like you just have to bounce around but anyway hopefully we are reading house of flame and shadow and we can talk you know the first half next week i don't know how many chapters are in that book so i'll just like announce on social media like what chapters we're going to cover so we're going to figure it or out and see knowing how fast we are going to make it through that book because like it's all new yes. for everybody we may end up just like going full yeah. tilt also because there are so many different bonus chapters available on different editions like i pre-ordered through walmart which i have never done and i'm scared but there was a Bryce and Azrael bonus chapter. So I ordered that one. I th- I think it's those mm-hmm. were the characters. So I'm going to be like tracking down all of the bonus chapters that I'm sure will pop up online so that we can read all of those too and have all of the info. That one, like I didn't, I hadn't read this half of this book yet. And so I'm like, oh, there is a connection. There is a connection. And then I'm like, oh, we saw it in this book. Never mind. That's not <laughs> a spoiler for anybody who's read this one. I'm just behind. No, there were some people that were upset about that, though. I don't think Sarah J. Math really checks her social media comments or anything like that because people are complaining about, you guys need to put a spoiler warning. Whenever you announce like, oh, this edition is going to have these characters on it, that's a spoiler. I'm like, you guys don't have to read the post. Like, the books have been out for a while. Like, Yeah, I like if know. you're behind, you're deal. behind. Like You're behind, you're behind. Like, don't look at that's this like, stuff if you That's like saying, like, a preview of a movie that's a sequel can't have any of, like, the, like... Yeah, it's... Exactly. ...information from the previous movie. Like, if you haven't watched it and they've had time to do a sequel, like, that's kind of on you to, yeah. to figure out, like, whether or not you're willing to get spoilers from watching a trailer. Like, don't read it. Plus, there's that old saying, it's like, it's not about the destination, it's about the journey. So it's like, even if you do notice a a spoiler, out of context spoiler, like you still have to read how everything unfolds and how those little pieces fall into place, right? I mean, I read that and like, I got the clue that like something was going to happen. I didn't know it was in this book, Yeah, but it didn't ruin this book. Like, but- but also At like all. SJM has left so many hints that something is going to happen. Like so many, dozens and dozens. Her saying Asriel's a kinky like doesn't affect my like ability <laughs> to like read the books and not know something's going to happen with Asriel and his kink later. Like, Can I just say, I hope after we cover House of Flame and Shadow that we're able to have a fun episode of just like... Michael, if you're listening, you have been talking about us needing to do a fuck Mary Kill episode forever. Yes. Like we can have and the, the Buzzfeed quizzes. Like I am working <laughs> on this, guys. I want to do these. Like who is Sandra? Like which which SJM character is Sandra? Like Fury. I mean, I feel like Sandra and her can't survives could like go full tilt on somebody, right? <laughs> um, I also see her as like a um like a little Elaine. Right? Like, I see me as Nesta, though. Like, you're a Nesta. I feel very Nesta like. You're and also Which is Nesta. why when everybody's like, I hate Nesta, I'm like, you bitches. I, oh, I, de- I will defend <laughs> Nesta until the day that I die. Like, like you just Nesta don't is, understand her. Nesta is very misunderstood. And they just think she's bitchy. And then they just don't care to find out anything more. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, Nesta's the best. Yeah, I like Nesta. But anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, I think we, we should do those. Like, who are you? We like, will. 
What does this say about you? Just giving everyone warning, like once we have talked about every single Throne of Glass, Akatar, Crescent City book, we are going to just do like full buffet style. Like if we're going to do a quiz, we're going to do a quiz and it's going to be full spoilers probably, but whatever. Also, like at some point we will talk David into reading the spicy scenes. No, he's agreed. So yes, this is happening. Um, it It'll will be something happen. Something in Silver Flames, probably. And like we have to, like I feel like there have been two scenes from this book that we could like include the like phone sex and the like sex on the ship that they end up somewhere different. Uh, even in the gym when Hunt was using lightning on Bryce's clit, basically like mm-hmm. giving her a little zap to to push her over. Yeah. David would, um, he's already agreed to it, so he's consented. <laughs> <laughs> it's not forced Shout out anymore. David. <laughs> Everyone's like, who the fuck is David? David um, is one of our best friends. We went to college with him, and he's a shit. And go back and watch our um, Kissing Booth episode. Kissing Booth episode, and you will figure out, like, how funny this is going to be. Like, I think, I think the one that like comes to mind, the comment that he made is just because there's a goalie doesn't mean that like you don't try and score still when he was talking about like chick having a boyfriend and he's like, eh, just, just some soccer. Just because there's a goalie doesn't mean you don't try and score. David says a lot of politically incorrect things by design because that is just how he is. That is his brand of humor. And so before anyone gets all like cancel culture (laughs) <laughs> and like crucifying him it's all just tongue in cheek and good yes fun. um he reminded me of somebody from this book and now i can't remember who is it therian no because no. i don't like therian anymore oh i think it was tristan because <laughs> do you tristan like david is, i do um <laughs> tristan is very like sarcastic and like very like just a shit stir i think is like that is yes. what david is it's just like I think he says things just to see what people's reactions will be. Mm-hmm. He, he like, throws stuff out there. To see if he can get anybody, like, riled. <laughs> just mm-hmm. a little riled. And I think he that's what Tristan does. Um, it's like, yeah. he just says things to Bryce to see if she'll, like, get her, like, feelings in a, like, a tizzy. It'll happen. It'll be fun. I think we should make him take some of those quizzes, too. Like, which SJM man are you? <laughs> where we can figure out like definitively who david is no, not even just a man i just want to know what sjm character he is it might surprise us or his soulmate <laughs> like i want to see who his soulmate sjm character is. shout out jenny sorry jenny <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, anyway we hope you enjoyed our little banter about chapters 39 onward of House of Sky and Breath by Sarah J. Mass, which is Crescent City Book 2. So like we've mentioned several times, we have covered every Throne of Glass book, every Akatar book to this point as of this recording in Crescent City now. So we have two episodes per book except for Frost and Starlight. So more than enough content and just discussions and opinions mm-hmm. about characters and plot threads and everything. So definitely go back and check those out if you haven't already. And, and a first. roller coaster of those opinions of characters, because sometimes yes. you love them and then you're like, oh, wait, I have poor taste in men. Never mind. Yes. Like, Adian. Adian ended up being a little disappointing how he acted toward oh, the end, yeah. but yeah. we loved some Adian at the start. But I can't express enough how grateful I am that Tara read all of these books, and now she knows exactly who I'm talking about now if I ever <laughs> just, like see some kind of like eye candy or humorous thing like she'll know exactly what i'm talking about and so i am Mm -hmm. overjoyed that my bestie has read the series all of the series now yep and we will be jumping into a new series of some sort and after all of this hasn't been decided yet but it will happen we have several book recommendations at our Story Darlings Amazon book club. I think there might be like 60 people in that group now. So I feel like it keeps jumping by 10 every time I report on it. But there are 60 of you in that group now, and there have been several book recommendations. So after we're done with House of Flame and Shadow, we'll definitely get on there and do like a little vote of what we should read. These are not big, thick series read-alongs which i'm glad about i know you're ready for a break too (laughs) yeah so 
I don't know if we'll be doing that again, but I guess never say never. But yeah, <laughs> I have a lot of Lucifer to watch because we will be covering Lucifer at some point. So this isn't just like books. Like we'll talk about any any story media, right? So it could be mm-hmm. a show. It could be a movie. We, we've done a lot of those in the past. And but they will also always have like a romantic aspect of it, hopefully. Like yeah. a little fun, fluffy, fluffy. So we're not just so serious and dead. Stuff yes, all the time. Yes. I can't I can't handle that. It has to be some fun in mm-hmm. in said book or movie or whatever. But Yep. So we're here. So get ready next two weeks. We're gonna be talking about House of Flame and Shadow, and I am so worried for <laughs> some of our characters, and we will yes. see what kind of shape they're in next week. <laughs> yes. Well, thanks for listening. And until then. Bye. bye.